for the arrival of His Excellency, the Grand Mufti of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Seric, accompanied by Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security and Minister for Home Affairs, Mr. Teo Chi Hien, and Minister for Information, Communication and the Arts, and Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs, Dr. Yaakob Ibrahim. His Excellency, the Grand Mufti of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Seric, Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, and Minister for Home Affairs, Mr. Teo Chi Hien, and Minister for Information, Communication and the Arts, and Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs, Dr. Yaakob Ibrahim, Members of Parliament, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Greetings of Peace, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. A very good afternoon to all, and welcome to the Moise Lecture 2011. My name is Nasir Johari, and it gives me great pleasure to be your MC for today. And if I may seek your indulgence, allow me to try this. Moye imeye Nasir Johari, eveliko miye zadovoltsvo da budem vas maestor ceremonie danas. Hvala, thank you. Got it, thank you. Hvala. Hvala. The Muis lecture this year will focus on the challenge of diversity in modern society to be delivered by His Excellency, the Grand Mufti of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Seric. Ladies and gentlemen, or Dami Igospodo, to proceed with today's program, I present to you our Honorable Chairperson for this afternoon, Minister for Information, Communication and the Arts, and Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs, Dr. Yaakob Ibrahim. Minister, please. Thank you very much. I'll speak in English. <laughs> Our distinguished guest, Grand Multi Sheikh Mustafa Cherik, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Home Affairs, Mr. Chi Hien, President of Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, Haji Alami Musa, Saibu Samaha, Mufti of Singapore, Dr. Fatris Bakaram, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you, to the Muslim audience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, on behalf of Singapore government, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guest, His Eminence, Sohiba Samaha, the Grand Mufti of Bosnia Herzegovina, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Cherik. Sheikh Cherik is in Singapore at the invitation of the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, or MUIS, under its Distinguished Visitors Program, or the DVP. My warm welcome also to Mrs. Azra Cherik, wife of our Grand Mufti, and also Imam Sunait Kobilika from the Islamic Council of Norway. I do hope that you had the time in between your heavy engagement programs to visit the many rich historical places that will allow you to discover our vibrant, multiracial and multicultural Singapore society. As Mika Minister, that is one of my KPI. <laughs> Muiz launched its DVP in 2006 with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, the late Dr. Sheikh Muhammad Said Tantawi, as the first distinguished visitor. Since then, Muiz had continued the tradition of inviting eminent Muslim leaders, statesmen and thinkers of international standing to speak to a Singaporean audience. Muiz would like them to share their views on the latest developments in contemporary issues relating to Islam and Muslims and their relations to the larger world community. In 2009, we were graced by the presence of Sheikh Dr. Hamad Badr Idin Hassan, the Grand Mufti of Syria. Today, we are honored to have with us an eminent scholar and a Muslim leader of international standing, Sheikh Mustafa Cherik. Sheikh Cherik is an illustrious figure within the global Muslim world. He is one of the few scholars in Islam who moves easily between the traditional and modern worlds and attempts at address addressing both through creative synthesis and progressive engagements. His inclusive approach and openness has won accolades from around the globe. Sheikh Cherik is also recognized internationally for his exceptional contributions to further peace and interfaith cooperation. His commitment to share an enlightened understanding of Islam is evident from his involvement in various groups throughout Europe, including in the European Council for Fatwas and Research. Under his guidance, 
Muslims living in Europe's urban, cosmopolitan and plural society are able to reconcile between living as contributive citizens, furthering the growth and development of their respective country and community, and being faithful to their religion. Sir Cherik is a strong proponent of adopting a contextual approach of understanding faith. This means that Muslims in every society must develop their own approaches and apply the universal principles of Islam within the, living, within the lived realities of each generation and community. Here in Singapore, we have developed our own Singapore Muslim identity that takes into account the lived realities of Muslims within a secular, cosmopolitan and plural society, something that we share in common with many Muslim communities in Europe. So let me now share some background about Sheikh Cherik's career. He received his early madrasa education in Sarajevo before pursuing his studies and receiving his first degree from the prestigious Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. He served the subsequent years as an imam at the Islamic Cultural Center of Greater Chicago in Northbrook, Illinois, USA. During his stint in America, he continued to pursue his education and was awarded his PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Chicago, and I've confirmed with him that his thesis advisor was the late Dr. Fazul Rahman. His dissertation has been published under the title The Roots of Synthetic Theology in Islam, and now used in theology classes across many universities around the world. He has taught and lectured in various universities, including the International Islamic University of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and his scholarship has since been acknowledged within various academic circles, Muslim and other faiths alike. Sheikh Cherik has been the Grand Mufti of Bosnia Herzegovina since 1999. Today, he will talk about the challenge of diversity in modern society. This topic is apt because the world is witnessing rapid globalization in an unprecedented scale. This global process is here to stay, bringing in new challenges and fragmenting societies further as each community becomes more and more diverse in terms of its demographic composition, lifestyle, belief, system, social political outlook and aspirations. Like many other religions, Islam itself can and has thrived in multicultural and multi-religious environment. We need to understand what diversity means and its implication to the way we lead our lives as Muslims in society today. Religion has always been a bedrock and a moral force in uniting people along common universal and humanistic values. Thus, diversity is not something that is at odds with the principle of religion. Instead, religion provides a guiding light in managing diversity through finding a middle ground into the need for peaceful acceptance of differences and the need for some form of unity within a community. So this is something which I hope will be tackled by our eminent speaker today, Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Cherit. Before we start with the lecture proper, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Singapore Press Holdings Foundation for being a gracious sponsors, sponsor of this event. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to invite Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Cherit to deliver his lecture on the topic, The Challenge of Diversity in Modern Society. Sheikh, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Dear brothers and sisters Honorable Deputy Minister Prime Minister Tio Chi Hain The Honorable Minister for Information Dr. Yaqub Ibrahim The President of MUIS Muhammad Alami Musa, the Honorable my dear friend Mufti of Singapore, Dr. Muhammad Patris Bakaram, the Diplomatic Corps of Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum, good evening and welcome to the Muiz lecture. I am honored by the invitation of the Minister Yaqub Ibrahims to deliver the lecture at the MUIS Distinguished Visitors Program 
here in Singapore, a friendly state and a unique society of economical, economical growth, political stability, cultural diversity, and religious plurality. It is my honor to be on the list with the Honorable Sheikh Al-Azhar of Egypt of your trust and selection to speak before this respective Asian audience. As you know, I am coming from a unique European country of Bosnia and Herzegovina with a thousand years of history of national, cultural, and religious diversity. Unfortunately, some irresponsible people recently have wanted to destroy this unique Bosnian legacy of cultural diversity by genocidal acts against indigenous Bosnian people. Thanks to God, their plan did not succeed, but it did cause many physical and mental injuries that need healing. It is appropriate for me here to extend a great appreciation and gratitude on behalf of my Bosnian people to all good people of Singapore who have supported us in our struggle for survival and freedom in Europe of many faiths. Thus, for pro your proposal for the subject of my lecture, the challenge of diversity in modern society is both appropriate and timely. It is appropriate because the principle of cultural diversity is my everyday life and destiny in Europe, and it is timely because there is no greater challenge for our global survival today than the challenge of our understanding and appreciating not only of a cultural diversity, but also of a biodiversity as conditio sine qua non for a continuous life on Earth. In fact, the principle of biodiversity should not be seen only as analogous to the principle of cultural diversity, but also as part and parcel of diversity as the principle of a balance in nature and in society. Yes, we need to explain that the idea of diversity does not mean difference in terms of two exclusive entities that are not joinable in any form or shape. The difference between good and evil, right and wrong, truth and false, ought to be understood as separate meanings that cannot be mixed whatsoever. On the other hand, it is this principle. On the other hand, diversity is a balance of two distinctive entities which make up a balanced whole in nature and in society. In the nature, it is the balance of hot and cold, wet and dry, moisture and sunlight that makes air breathable, water drinkable, and food eatable for us. Not only that, but also the fact that we have more air than water and more water than food in the nature because we need more air than water and more water than food for our survival tells us that somebody does take care about us down here. When I was a teenager, Water was free and music for money. Now, music is free, but water is for money. I hope I will not live the time when air will be for money. <laughs> Indeed, here, in the, here is the merciful Ar-Rahim and the beneficial Ar-Rahman the Creator, Al-Khaliq, who has informed us in the Holy Quran that the earth is extended and its mountains are stable and everything that is planted on the earth is properly balanced. 
والأرض مددناها وألقينا فيها رواسي وأنبتنا فيها من كل شيء مبزون The same principle of balanced diversity is set up for human societies in terms of multiple possibilities of human languages, races, nations, cultures, religions, etc. It is the principle of the diversity of human expressions that makes our life on earth wonderful. It is this cultural and social diversity that should drive us toward a better understanding of each other for the sake of enriching each other of knowledge that we need for survival. Indeed, unlike a plant and an animal, man, as Ayn Rand rightly said, has no, and I quote, has no automatic code of survival. He has no automatic set of action, no automatic set of values. His senses do not tell him automatically what is good for him or evil, what will benefit his life or endanger it, what goals he should pursue and what means will achieve them, what values his life depends on, what course of action is required. His own consciousness has to discover the answers to all these questions, but his consciousness will not function automatically. Man, the highest living species on this earth, the being whose consciousness has a limitless capacity for gaining knowledge, man is the only living entity born without guarantee of remaining conscious at all. Man's particular distinction from all other living species is the fact that his consciousness is volitious. So he has free will, end of quote. This is why the first divine imperative for man has been read in the name of thy sustainer who has created man out of a germ cell who has taught man the use of the pen. Read, for thy sustainer is the most bountiful one. He taught man what he did not know. Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaqal insana min alaq, ikra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama insana ma lam yalam. He, the almighty and the intelligent creator, taught men to behold that God has created all human beings out of a male and a female and have made them into nations and tribes so that they might come to know one another. Verily, the noblest of them in the sight of God is the one who is most deeply conscious of God, of himself and the world. Behold, God is all-knowing, all-aware. يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر ما أنسى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعرفوا إن أكرمكم إن الله أتقاكم. In addition to that, the Holy Quran reminds us once again of the importance of us being conscious of the principle of cultural and social diversity by stressing the fact that among God's signs are the diversity of your languages and races. Indeed, in this there are messages for all those who are knowledgeable. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ وَالْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ صدق الله العظيم Hence, the diversity of cultural and social life is a sign, is a message for those who want to hear it, for those who want to know that there are between 3,000 and 8,000 existing languages in the world, that approximately there are 50,000 cultures in the world, and that there are 19 major world religions which are subdivided into a total of 270 large religious groups and many smaller ones. These figures are in opposition to the modern myth which says that 
With the advance of science, one set of values will be accepted everywhere. Is it not the other way around? As John Gray would ask us, can we not accept that human beings have divergent and conflicting, conflicting values and learn to live with this fact? It is a strange notion that humanity is destined for a single way of living when history is so rich in conflict and contrivance." End of quote. But the principle of diversity of cultural and social life is not necessarily conflict and contrivance. It can be, as it were, a reason for a creative work as a result of an interaction of distinctive cultures and religions. For instance, Europe cannot escape the fact of the historical contribution of both Judaism and Islam to the shaping of its religious principles, both in terms of its Christian and humanistic traditions. It is a historical fact that if it had not been for the Muslim Ibn Sina, Avicenna, the rationality of the Christian theology of Thomas Aquinas would hardly have been possible. And if it had not been for both the Muslim Ibn Rushd, Avaros, and the Jewish Maimonides in Andalus, Spain, it would be not have been possible to think of European humanism in Renaissance as early as the 14th century. We can go on wondering about the principle of cultural and social diversity, but the biodiversity is even more puzzling and more challenging for us to understand our situation in the world. It is enough to mention here the fact that all ants weigh the same as all humans that there are 300 species of bacteria in your mouth, that 5,000 species of plant were introduced to the United States from elsewhere, that parts of Europe have more species now than before humans arrived, and that biodiversity, which is now in danger, can be saved at one-fourth the cost of destructive subsidies. Scientists have now distinguished 1.75 million species. Most people know of fewer than 0.01% of them. Biodiversity supports ecosystem services, including air quality, climate, water, purification, pollination, and prevention of erosion. Since the Stone Age, species loss has accelerated above the prior rate driven by human activity. Estimates of species loss are at a rate 100 to 10,000 times as fast as it typical in the fossil record. Non-material benefits include spiritual and aesthetic values, knowledge systems, and the value of education. Biodiversity's relevance to human health is becoming an international political issue as scientific evidence builds on the global health implications of biodiversity loss. The issue is closely linked with the issue of climate change, as many of the anticipated health risks of climate change are associated with changes in biodiversity, that is, changes in populations and distribution of disease vectors, scarcity of fresh water, impacts on agricultural diversity and food resources, etc. This is because the species most likely to disappear are those that buffer against infectious disease transmission while surviving species tend to be the ones that increase in disease transmission such as that of West Nile virus, Lyme disease and hantavirus according to a study done co-authored by Felicia Kissing an ecologist at Bard College and Drew o. Harwell Associate Director for Environment of the Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future at 
Cornell University. Hence, it is a self-evident truth that the existence and the maintenance of biodiversity depend on a human understanding of the value of life. It is a human will and a human choice to continue to exist or to cease to exist. As John Galt says in Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged, I quote, man has been called a rational being, but rational is matter of choice, and the alternative his nature offers him is rational being or suicidal animal. Man has to be man by choice. Man has to hold his life as a value by choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice. He has to discover the values it requires and practices his virtues by choice. A code of values accepted by choice is a good, is a code of morality. Indeed, the real issue here is a kind of morality of the modern society. The morality that is either of God's spirit of the original faith of the human consciousness that we Muslims call a taqwa as well as of the man's rational ability to recognize true or false, right or wrong, and good or evil, or the morality that is based on pure human feeling, taste, urge, wish, or whim. So, the idea of a modern society is neither good nor bad in itself, but it can be good or bad according to the moral values which are based on the basic principles of cultural and social diversity from which other principles are derived, such as the principle of freedom versus slavery, the principle of right versus might, and the principle of science versus mythology. Thus, the notion of a modern society is not a final cultural and social development. It is just a model of something that accurately resembles something else. And this something that a model of the modern society might accurately resemble is the principle of diversity with all its basics of freedom, right, and science the principle that is fundamental truth, law, or motive force for advancing the value of human life and dignity. How close is the modern society to the principle of diversity as a motive force for advancing the value of human life and dignity? I am sure that every one of you has his his, her own answer to this question. But I will remind you that ours is the global civilization of big paradoxes, such as the higher degrees in education, the less degree of ethics. The more knowledge, the less wisdom. The more experts, the less solutions. The more wealth, the less moral values the bigger houses, the smaller families, the faster communication, the less decent human relation, the more books about pollution, the less care about natural environment, the more conferences about peace, the more wars around the world, the more call for reason, the less rational behavior, the more monumental churches, the less attendees in the churches, the more attendees in the mosques, the less peace and security in many Muslim cities. The more tears on the wall of tears in Jerusalem, the less peace and security in the Holy Lands. Are clear indications that we must change our way of life. We have to discover a new motive force for morality, a new drive for a new start that will lead us to the basics of humanity to a human fundamentalism or a fundamental humanism. As we all know, it was man called Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, 
who had written more than a thousand years ago, The Art of War, which is just an illustration of what it has been on man's mind through most of his history. Of course, man could have chosen to write The Art of Peace, but he had not. Man could have advocated the, for the just peace instead of the just war, but he had not. And man could have opted for the holy peace instead of the holy war, but he had not. Indeed, the art of peace instead of the art of war, the just peace instead of the just war, and the holy peace instead of the holy war by choice is a blueprint for the Noah Ark of our survival, for our salvation, and for the continuation of our civilization. Here, I found it useful to bring to our attention the guiding principles adopted in 2005 by UNESCO Convention on the Protection and the Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. First, principle of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Cultural diversity can be protected and promoted only if human rights and fundamental freedoms, such as freedom of expression, information, and communication, as well as the ability of individuals to choose cultural expressions are guaranteed. Second, principle of sovereignty. States have, in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations and the principles of international law, the sovereign right to adopt measures and policies to protect and promote the diversity of cultural expressions within their territory. Third, principle of equal dignity of, of and respect for all cultures, the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions, presupposes the recognition of equal dignity of an and respect for all cultures, including the cultures of persons belonging to minorities and indigenous people. Fourth, principle of international solidarity and cooperation. International cooperation and solidarity should be aimed at enabling countries, especially developing countries, to create and strengthen their means of cultural expression, including the cultural industries with whether nascent or established at the local, national, and international levels. Fifth, principle of the complementary of economic and cultural aspects of development. Since culture is one of the main springs of development, the cultural aspects of development are as important as its economic aspects, which individuals and peoples have the fundamental right to participate in and enjoy. Six, principle of sustainable development. Cultural diversity is a rich asset for individuals and societies. The protection, promotion, and maintenance of cultural diversity are an essential requirement for sustainable development for the benefit of present and future generations. Seventh, principle of equitable access. Equitable access to a rich and a diversified range of cultural expressions from all over the world and access of cultures to the means of expressions and dissemination constitute important elements for enhancing cultural diversity and encouraging mutual understanding. Eighth, principle of openness and balance. When states adopt measures to support the diversity of cultural expressions, they should seek to promote in an appropriate manner openness to other cultures of the world and to ensure that these measures are geared to the objectives pursued under the present convention. Dear brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you, not, you didn't fall asleep. I will now awaken you up. Based on what I have seen in Singapore during my short visit that gave me the opportunity to experience the unique Center for Religious Understanding and Harmony, to meet and to talk before the respected Mufti and Ulama of Singapore about the role of fatwa, to engage with smart and enthusiastic students, the Al-Junaid Al Madrasa, 
whom I see here, Mawjud, to deliver the khutbah and lead the Juma prayer in the Sultan Mosque, then to have the lunch meeting with the different religious rep representatives of Singapore, and to spend more than two hours last night with an energetic and full of life group of Muslim youth who have made me honored to have met them and I have and made me privileged to talk to them as well as my privilege to have met the president, the prime minister, the two deputy prime ministers who are, one of them is minister for finance and manpower as well, the Minister of State for the Ministry of Commu Community Development, Youth and Sports, the Major General as the Acting Minister for the Ministry of Communication, Community Development, Youth and Sports, and to be the guest of honor of the Honorable Minister for Information, Communication and the Arts of this country, gives me the right to testify to the whole world that Singapore is contributing its valuable piece of wood, should I say a piece of stainless steel, to the Noah Ark of human salvation based on the guiding principles of the UNESCO Convention. <laughs> so thank you, dear Singaporeans, for your conscience, cultural diversity, religious plurality, social harmony, and your sustainable and substantial contribution to the salvation of humanity by spreading